It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Uh, here with me, I have Storm Leroy. I'm very excited about this episode, a fellow Brooklyn native. Uh, so Storm, thank yes. you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it, man. Man, thank you for having me, Brooklyn Knight. <laughs> definitely, definitely. That's a fact. Uh, great. So Storm, uh, first, I would love to hear more about uh, your childhood, what your childhood was like, and what you saw, or maybe what you didn't see that ultimately shaped your view of building wealth. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Um, for me, it was a, a, a moment that I'll never forget. Um, when I was young, you know, my dad worked construction and he would always, this was back when they didn't have, they didn't have um, unions and things of that nature. So my dad would always, he would, it would come in hardworking, you know, the real grit grind after being outside and more or less, more or less, they would pick you. Sort of like, you know, what the Mexicans have to go through now. That's what blacks go through. They would be outside waiting to get picked. And um, when my dad would come home, he would always have me come downstairs and take his boots off, take his boots off, take his boots off. You know, it was, it was, it was 10 of us, you know, but my dad always chose me, come down, take his boots off, no matter what I'm doing, and my brothers take his boots off. So one day, <clears throat> one day um, he gets uh, caved in. They were building the hospital, Woodhall. And you from Brooklyn, you know Woodhall yeah. on Broadway in Marcus Garvey Hospital. Mm -hmm. So while they was digging a, a trench and reinforcing it, it collapsed on him. So he was collapsed in from like the chest down. So they just brought him back home. So it wasn't no take him to the hospital. Like I said, it wasn't no unions, 70s. And um, when they brought him in, he called me down. And he's, you know, leaning back on the couch, take his boots off. So I'm taking his boots off again. And he says, you know why I asked you to do this? And I'm like, why? He says, so you don't have to go through what I'm going through. Hit me. Hit me. I got it. I got it. Totally got it. I saw the look on his face. And, you know, and he could differentiate something for me because when I was young, out of all my brothers and sisters, I was more, I, you know, I was the playing the games and stuff like that. But I was a kid. I wanted a bank account. I was into electronics and into, you know, the, the Commodore 64s, taking them apart. I can even go further back to Tandy computers, taking those apart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Coleco, yeah. the first Ataris. And, and it was always that entrepreneur thing in me. And he saw it and boom. Once he shared that with me, because we rented a place like anybody else in the 70s, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I said, you know what? Cool. Yeah, I got to do something with it. So I didn't, of course, I was too young to actually metamorph that into ownership or anything, but the message was always there. And that was in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Definitely. That's powerful. That's powerful. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you go from that point as a kid, that seed is planted. Um, so, you know, why did you decide to, you know, buy your first property? We talked a bit off camera and I believe you mentioned you just right. invested in 99. Um, so can't take us, take us back to, to back to then the circumstance and, and yeah. what made you say, all right, it's time to get a crib now. Well, 1999, the summer, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was um one of those things where back then my dad also mentioned to me, you know, he was like, don't pay anybody's rent. Even though we were paying people rent, we couldn't get ownership back then in the 70s. It was a different world with Blacks on their properties. He was very adamant on owning, owning. You know, got my first rental. It just didn't feel right paying that rent. I'm like, yo, I'm paying rent. And even though my parents didn't own the house, we lived in a brownstone that we had the duplex floors written it out, but it felt like our house. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it kind of felt like we owned the house, even though they were paying rent. And then when I rented this apartment, it felt strange to go from living in a house and, you know, even just, just having my own place felt good, but it felt strange. So I said, 
uh, wow, this, this is gonna have to change. Something's gonna have to change, right? But it really didn't hit me really hard until, um, wow, man, we're going into a story now. We are, it's story time. <laughs> we're gonna go into a real story here. Yeah, yeah. So um, this was back in early, early 2000s. I, I was married at one time, got divorced. And I was in a spot where I said, you know what? I'm buying me a place. And I was so adamant at buying me a place. So I started looking and I tried to um, get myself in this space where, you know what? If you're going to buy you a house, buy you a big house, because I came from a brownstone. And back then brownstones were for her 300, dollars $400,000. And that's what I did. I said, I'm gonna buy me a place. I'm not buying an apartment. So I bought me a brownstone for about, it was about 375, close to 400. But what I did was I threw in another 150,000 for a construction loan, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what we used to do back then, the game was, you get your construction loan for 150,000, a place wouldn't even need it, but they was giving it away. So I took the other 150,000 and bought me another brownstone. Wow. I took the 100,000 as a down payment, on another brownstone, there's 50,000. I did do some fix up in that brownstone. So the game was much different. So now I'm rocking two brownstones. Wow. I'm living in, I'm living in um, one of them on the ground floor, rented the rest of them out. And the other one I had to do repairs on, I rented out the top two floors, but the bottom floor, I was gutting that. Well, I gutted the whole place, first mm -hmm. of all. Then once I finished, I rented out. And then the bottom, I wanted to be something special for me. So what I did was the ground floor, I gutted towards the basement and I separated the basement and I duplex going down. Wow. Basement was huge. So I said, oh, I don't need all the space for a basement, put a spiral staircase in, did my walk-in closets, office downstairs, upstairs, beautiful layout. That's where I'm at now. Yeah. And um, incredible. Like you couldn't even tell now where I'm at. This is yeah. actually my spiral coming down into the walk, walk inside of the basement, which is like another apartment. Right. So um, when I bought that place, I said, um, like I said, I was living in one, renovated that one. Then once I moved out of that into the brownstone I'm in now, it wasn't never about buying these places at 400000 and thinking they were going to be worth $1.72 million. Mm -hmm. Like down the block from me, three weeks ago, they just sold their place for $2.1 million. Are you serious? Eight doors down. Yeah. What? And I paid 400000 for mine, right? So, you know, I'm going to cash out in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's big time right, right there, man. Right. So at the time of, of doing that, it wasn't, no one had a crystal ball knew it was, was going to grow to this level. My thing was, I just didn't want to pay rent. Mm -hmm. I was, um, had tenants paying the mortgage. So I was working for Verizon. I was keeping my check. I've had good, crazy money. It was the late 90s, early 2000s. We hanging out. I'm hanging out with my friends. I got money. We traveling Cancun. We going everywhere. And the thought was never about real estate becoming an end game because I'm young and I'm making a lot of money. So um, once I did that and I started hanging out, enjoying myself, and I got into the work world, once I got into the workforce, I said, man, I don't want to be here. Like, <laughs> I can't do this for till I retire 65. So no way. Great job and everything. But as, as we all know, you get complacent. And I got complacent because the money was so great and I was making good money at work, making good money from my rentals. And I said, yo, um, yeah, this has to change. You have to really do something. So then I looked into real estate and I said, what's making me that money for me to be able to retire early? Mm -hmm. Of course, it was the real estate. That's when I said, I'm going to get into this thing hard. The, the properties here were going for 800, 900,000. Right. So the train was over for the 400,000. Yeah. I said, all right, cool. What, where can I get properties that make sense? And I was hearing about out of state investing. I said, you know what? Let me look into it. So I spoke to my friends. They were, we were all buying a little house here, house there. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, man, I don't know about out of state investing. I don't, I, I really wouldn't mess around with it. You know, it's a risky market, this and that. And I said, you know what? I was always, like I said, an entrepreneur, always doing things. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to look into it. So then um, I actually, spoke to a gentleman who was out of real estate investing, invested out of state. And he made something clear to me. He, he was a, a older white gentleman, mm -hmm. right? He made something clear to me. He said, 
Well, believe it or not, this, this isn't conducive for you. They don't want you in this market. They don't want you in real estate. Black, you know, he kept it a buck with me. He said, but you know what? I'm gonna share the information with you because you're adamant about it. Mm -hmm. And once he starts sharing me the jewels of the information, how to do this and the out of state market and how it works, that's when my vision said, you know what? Okay, now I have to figure out how do I do this with the information he gave me from here? And I went online and I found bigger pockets. Love it. You know, love it, love I don't know if you, bigger pockets. Yeah. yeah so yeah, bigger right. pockets changed my life. Love it. Okay, I'll man. let you jump in because I can keep going. No, you're good. You're good. Man, there's a couple of things I want to mention in there. Um, so you just mentioned that a house, but you said eight doors down sold for two point something million. 2.1, 2, 2, 2.15. Yeah, man, that's, that's crazy. And you know, it's, it's crazy, man. Cause you think about it, yours were three, 400,000. Um, and people all 20 years ago, 20 years ago, it's not too long ago, people. Right. So I have, I have a question for you from your perspective, cause you're a native, you're familiar with the area, you grew up there. Um, at that time, could you have foreseen like, in your eyes, was gentrification starting a little bit back then, or was it still pretty far off? Like, what what, what were you seeing at that time as somebody who's been there your whole life? In um, well, when you say back then, are we talking twenty years ago? Like twenty or years when ago. When did it start to? Like twenty, 20 years, years ago. ago did, you, did you start seeing any signs of it, or was it pretty much the area? No. Okay. No, we we definitely didn't see any signs of it. You know, twenty years ago, we still had um, the 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 remnants and the after effects of the crack era okay you know what i mean you had those people who sold crack in the 80s and that were on crack in the 80s now in the 90s recovering crack addicts they still was in the street you had the kids that were born from the 80s of being crack babies now crack they were crack baby teenagers they were crack teenagers so the adolescents the 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 energy the schools were bad because they weren't um things weren't I guess they weren't uh, taught properly. They weren't prepared for when that baby that's been hyped up on crack for so many years become a teenager and go to school. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's when you had a lot of the ADD started becoming more and more popular. And, um, you know, they talk about it now in songs and now, but trust me, it was nothing like back then. No, I mean, it was rough. Schools were totally different. The kids were different. The mindset was different. So the area was really, bad but you saw the change coming like i didn't live in bed originally i originally lived in crown heights mm -hmm. and in crown heights it wasn't that bad you know but then when i like i said wanted to get into the real estate and i chose bed because i seen that it was closer to the downtown area mm -hmm. it was close to train system it was by all those key factors that makes a big difference when you're investing Yep. And then I was like, it's a, it's a big house. I have my own backyard. There's space. And it's crazy because when I first wanted to buy in bed style, you know, my friends who people can't see the future a lot about, they can't see the big picture. But you buying out there for, man. You're going to best style. You wild. You're going to <laughs> best style, bro. You, I was like, yo, I'm good. Trust me. I'm getting this here and I'm going to get another one. You yeah. know, so definitely the signs were, the signs weren't there, obviously, right in front of you. But if you knew what to look for, those little things, more money coming into the community, more shops, more businesses, people given opportunities, um, the buildings are being bought out, like, you know, during the era of the, 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 I won't say abandoned buildings like cracks, eras, but there was a lot of buildings that were just there. You know, even when I bought this building, there was, um, three abandoned buildings on the block, but the word abandoned sounds bad. They were just, you know, weren't habitable. Right. They weren't dilapidated, like burnt out, windows burnt out, boards. Uh -huh. You know, they were well kept. It's just nobody lived there. Yeah, I started to see a transition of these buildings becoming, if not rented out of, or fixed up, cleaned up. Yeah. You know, the yard, the front, the lot down the block is being turned to a garden okay, something's going on here. So that's when I said, yeah, all right, let me, let me get down here. And, and that's what made me get into the Brooklyn. But it's my out of state that we, we're more here to, to talk about, right? Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I think, I think it's 
the beginning is always in, the beginning. The beginning is always important because um, yes. at that time you're 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 a young person and you didn't know everything, but you just no. you had an inkling. You're like, all right, it's a big house. It's by the train. Um, you know, you had a couple things, and you're like, all right, I'm gonna make this investment. And now, fast forward. Obviously, you didn't know everything that was going to happen. You didn't know Brooklyn no. was going to transform, but you made a good decision, you know, um, and I just don't want people to, to miss that. You know, sometimes like you may not have all the information. You may not, you know, no one has a, a crystal ball, but, you know, if you can hit a couple yeah. of factors that you're looking for, it can set you up big time down the road. And now you're in a position where something sold for like four times, you know, what you purchase your yep. property for, which of course puts you in a position to play some play play some ball. Yeah, yeah. You you know, I, I want to piggyback off of that because you, you made definitely made a great point. It's for those people and and I'm very much with this. Like I don't want to give people the the automatic um success in the beginning. I want to tell you the dirt where I came from in the dirt, right? Which is so true. And with that being said, you cannot be afraid to do what other people aren't doing. You know, like a lot of people say things like, well, if out of state investing or, or real estate is that big of a thing, then how come so many other people aren't doing it? And I tell them, no, the people you know just aren't doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I came to buy in bed -Stuy, it was very few black people like me buying. Like, the people that were buying were Jewish. Mm -hmm. They were coming in here, buying them and just holding. Them. And they were doing those things. Nobody, like I said, it was maybe one other friend of mine who was buying and, you know, me and him connect. And that was it. You know, I bought, like I said, I bought another one. So it's crucial to say to yourself, just because everybody else isn't doing it, that doesn't mean I'm doing the wrong thing. Maybe you're just leader of the pack. You're ahead of what's going on. And sometimes, you cannot deny that thing in you is telling you this is the right thing to do. You have to investigate, ask yourself the questions, search for the answers, and don't rely from those answers from someone who isn't doing the research or doesn't know it's half as much as you know, especially if they're not a risk taker. Like if, if worse came to worse and you bought a property, if I bought this property for $400,000 and okay, cool, things didn't work out, I'll sell it for $400,000. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You have something tangible there. People really fear um, the, the thought of not being able to get to that point of what they thought it would be when in actuality you did the hard part because you stepped into the arena of the unknown yeah. to actually do something. So you're 100% right. I want people to know this side of, of the game, but not to be turned off and go, well, it's over now. These houses are worth $2 million. So yeah. I don't want to hear about him. He got lucky with a $400,000 house. Yeah, but what I did was transition that into find me another market that catered to the same kind of low market. When I got in at 400, I found another market to keep growing. You know, so that's the encouragement. You're 100% right. Those yeah. stories need to be told. Definitely, definitely. So uh, out of state, out of state, talk to us about the beginning of that, you know, um, you you mentioned that you you met you met a a guy who kind of put you onto game. You met some people on bigger pockets. Uh, talk to us about, I guess, you get all that information. Now, talk to us about like, all right, when you found a place you wanted to invest and and took it from there. Okay, um, once I did all my research meeting talk to everybody on bigger pockets the key was taking that relationship online and taking it offline like connecting with these people in the chat rooms the forums you know messaging each other back and forth and then going look let's set up a call and i'm talking to investors in other states i'm talking uh, uh about property management companies building your team this and that and everybody's like when you when you're in the real estate you cannot stop talking about real estate and you will share this information with anybody who's willing to listen. And that's <laughs> yeah. why I tell people, when you talk to people like me or someone like yourself, you need to get the recorder going because I'm going to give you so much information, so much jewels. Yeah. You're not going to be able to write it down. 
you're not. So just be prepared to go, dag, I missed all of that information, right? So this is what they were doing to me. They were just hitting me, boom, 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 boom. And what I, what I did learn, and I have a, a section, you know, I have a course that I teach. And inside there, I have a whole section dedicated to bigger pockets. Like it tells you how to navigate and become uh, from a newbie to literally a pro. Because mm -hmm. when you get in there, you can't hit that form and start asking questions. You kill yourself. And I literally jumped in. I was like, what's the best place to invest? What's this and that? And, you know, somebody actually pulled my coattail and said, listen, my man, I know that you're very active here. But don't ask the same questions that somebody else asks. Type the question in the form and search for the question. The answers are going to be there. You know, you come here with a good question that somebody hasn't asked, you're going to get a lot of people replying and then they're going to remember you. You're going to become friends with them. You're going to, you know, and I said, okay, cool. And that was it. I started searching, making those relationships. So then now once I finally figured out and I said, okay, I want to invest in my first property. Um, the key was finding a property management company, mm -hmm. you know, well, even before then I had my funds in place yeah. because I had sold one of my properties here at a height where 800,000, I said, it's not going to get no higher than eight, but if I know, and I would have kept it to two. Right. So I started looking in, um, I started looking in Georgia. I started looking in Alabama. I started looking in, uh, Delaware, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I started looking everywhere. Yeah. So once I narrowed, narrowed my searches down, I said, you know what? I'm going to get into to, uh, Indian, Indianapolis. My first properties, I start looking there and I connect with a property management company. So once I got the property management company situation together, mm -hmm. they were so intricate because just from having these experiences, I were able to tell them where I wanted to invest. Yeah. What could they do? Um, what were they fees? What I need to, what, uh, what could they help me with? Things of that nature. And the key was people on bigger pockets tell you up front, this is a great one. This is a bad one. This is a good one. That's a bad one. Like once they kind of cemented the relationship, this one is it. I'm going yeah. with that because these are the other investors who are seasoned. Why am I not going to listen to them? Yeah. So then once I listened to them, got the property, got the first one up and running, I said, cause I was a landlord here in Brooklyn. So yeah. I was constantly always doing stuff. But once I did that and I realized, yeah, I don't have, I just bought a place with tenants. I don't have nothing to do. Let me get another one. So next week, I'm looking for another one. Two weeks, got another one. Close on that one, about a month, another one. Next you know, cool, another one. Said, so, okay, now the only only hiccup for me was um, we're dealing with banks, yeah. you know? So I tell people there's this thing I call a trifecta. Mm -hmm. The trifecta is using one mortgage to get you three investment properties. And that's what I did with banks, right? I have my primary residence. But when I wanted to do an investment property, I had the investment property purchase agreement, had the pre-approval. Now, what I tell people is when you're doing mortgage pulls from banks, it doesn't slam your credit because you're mortgage shopping. Yeah. You're mortgage shopping. So people go, oh, they keep pulling my credits. No, that's different because these are banks and you're looking for mortgages. So there's an exception, right? right. So once I got my first property pre-approved, they're doing the, 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 you know, the inspection, the appraisal. Mm -hmm. And all that. So now it's going to underwriting. I get another property. I get another pre-approval. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to get another one now. Woo. So not knowing all along that this one didn't close yet and how the benefits of me doing this helped me. So now I did a, got another one pre-approval, did the inspection, got all this. Now I'm under I'm in underwriting with this next property. Mm -hmm. So now with this next property, I said, man, I'm going to get another one. But the other one closed. I look at my credit report. I said, it's not showing yet. You know what? I'm going to see something. Got another pre-approval. Went and found another property. Got that property. Did the appraisal close? Boom. Next thing you know, I had three mortgages from one credit pool. Waited. Three months later, that's when all three popped up. I said, holy crap. I have to share that with people because yeah. what I learned is when you, as an investor, when you deal with banks, banks are not made for you to become an investor. It made for you to be a homeowner first. Thing. Right. They want you to be a homeowner. So, but other people that I know that have investment properties, they had a primary and then investment property. They would get a bank loan. And then once that investment property closed, the banks will not, when you try to get another investment property, banks will not consider your rent from the investment property towards the mortgage. So now they're looking at your salary 
to pay for your primary residence mortgage and the investment property mortgage, they're looking at your salary to cover that mortgage. Right. Most banks do not count that money at all. They will count a small percentage of it. They want to see the lease, but most of them do not count. So now here it is. They go, we can't give you another mortgage. So now you're stuck with one primary residence and one investment property. Where when I did the trifecta is what I call it now, I end up getting three properties from doing that system. So I, wow. I preach that system and tell people, if you're going to do it, try to do that system. Because once you get one, you consider yourself moving into hard money and private money from that point on. Yeah. You know, learn to be um, financially savvy because when you get into real estate, as you know, we have to become strategically smart and crafty with doing deals and numbers and, right. and, and uh, hard money and things of that nature. So that was how I literally got into buying my first properties and now to snowballing. Man, I like that. I like that, man. We definitely going to have to have you come uh, do a session with the, the our real estate investing community, man, because that's that's just the tip of the iceberg. I know there's a whole lot more behind yes. that. Oh my God, I got so much. <laughs> so many tricks to how to, how to pull this off, man. Remember, I've been up to 24 properties. Right. And I can tell you so many tricks of the trade. It's it's beautiful. It's Definitely. beautiful. Man, I'm looking forward to it. For those who are not aware, we have the Bread Real Estate Investing Community. Uh, we have guest speakers twice a month. So definitely going to have Storm if you're interested. The link is in the show notes or go to blackrealestatedialogue.com. But definitely we'll dive more into that. Um, so Storm, uh, Indian, Indianapolis, what made you choose Indian, Indianapolis? Uh, I know you did research, you were talking to people. Um, yeah. What was it about Indianapolis? Like, all right, cool. This is a place I'm gonna start. We're gonna do it here. Cash flow. Mm -hmm. Everything boiled down to cash flow. Um, the market was really good there. The, the cash flow was, uh, we look for numbers like this with, there's the 1% rule. Mm -hmm. There's the 2% rule. You know, we were getting literally three to 4% the return on investment numbers. You know, my ROI was literally 20, 30%. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, bet I'm in, you know? Yeah. So once I seen those numbers, because I'm not looking at it as equity, when people talk to me about investing out of state and the first thing they say is, well, I'm going to get this property because the, the equity is going to go to this amount. Mm -hmm. I tell them, well, you have to consider several things. Consider your age, right? So if you say a property will probably maximize and grow in equity 10 to 20 years, and I use my property as an example, it took 20 years to go from 40 to $2 million. How old are you at that point? If you're 30 years old and you said you're going to wait 20 years to maybe your property go from 400 to $2 million, first of all, that's a maybe. First of all, that's a maybe. Now, what you're doing is you're tying up a lot of money into a property with minimum cash flow. So now let's say if you minimize and I'm a sacrifice getting me great cash flow because I know this property is going to be worth this much 10 or 20 years from now. Do you know how much money you're losing? Like as an investor for me with real estate, I'm never looking at the equity in because to maximize equity, you're gonna to have to hold properties for somewhere up into the 10 to 20 year range. You're not gonna have those situations of the San Francisco's where you might get that impact of the boom, or for example, now where Google and Tesla's moving to Texas. So it's gonna be a sharp bump in the, the equity in those property. Those are slim to uh, like really rarely times for that to happen. And then you must never forget you're into this for cash flow because you're an investor. So that should always be the top of your list. And for me, I never hold a property more than five years. Mm -hmm. I'm a five year investor rule. You know what I mean? Like if you know about investing in properties and you know about how important cash flow is, the reason why I only keep a property for five years is because I buy a property, tenant occupied. This is my business model. Yeah. I buy tenant occupied properties. Normally they're section eight or some kind of program, right? And I go in buying these properties because I don't want to get a property out of state and I don't want to have to deal with contractors to have to start fixing those up to find me a tenant. Mm -hmm. I'm a contractor. I had a contracting company. So I know how contractors to play with your money. So now say you get a property, you need a contractor to fix it up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're working somewhere else. Your money's going. Now you got that monthly mortgage. You got the holding costs, the insurance fees, all okay. of these things. And you're over here in New York. This property is 
in Indianapolis. You don't know what's going on. So now uh, we need a little more time. But to avoid that for me, now remember, you're losing money with this process. And, I, and I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah. I'm just saying you have to really know who you're working with, who the contractors. But for new out-of-state investors, get you a tenant occupied because this is how it would work. You would get you a property. Let's say it's $60,000. Tenants paying 800 bucks. A mortgage for a $60,000 property might be $300, $350. So now let's, let's say it's 400. Tenants paying eight. You're making $400 every single month cash flowing. So that's $4,800 off for that one property. You don't have to do any repairs because it's habitable. You don't have to do anything because someone's living there. And if it's a Section 8 property, you're not trying to take a non-Section 8 property, walk, uh, or walk into the HUD office and try to get it approved because now they're backed up. Their, their um, certificate process might be tedious. So now you're waiting for a Section 8 uh, voucher to come through the door. But if I buy a Section 8 property, I inherit their certificate. Right. So I automatically become a Section 8 landlord right out the gate. Right. So now my money's coming in every month. Now, with the, here's the inspection process where it helps me stay within the five year. When I'm buying a tenant occupied, I get an inspector to go and inspect the property. But now my property manager goes with my inspector because his job is to inspect how the tenants are living. Mm -hmm. If the tenants are taking care of the property, the property is being well maintained because remember, he has to collect the rent and he has to take care of it. So right. he's going to go in there and go look around. Hey, Storm, this, this is a no brainer. They take care of the place. The cash flow is good. The rent roll, which you, the rent roll is what shows when the tenant pays the rent. The mm -hmm. rent roll shows they haven't been late for 12 months. That's a no brainer for me. Right. I got somebody's paying rent. I don't have to wait on nothing. My property manager. Cool. Now the inspector tells me your roof is good. It'll last you for about seven, eight years. HVAC is good. It'll last you about seven, eight years. That lets me know from the moment I sign at the closing, I'm cash flowing $400 for the next five years without having to fix anything major. Because if your HVAC goes and your HVAC is $4,000, you just fix the $4,000 HVAC. You're, back, you're now set back one full year of cash flow. Mm. So you just spent one year of that money gone. Now let's say you, you go, you know what? I'll fix the HVAC then. I got a new 15 year HVAC. So now you want to keep it for longer. But remember, you didn't put a new roof on. You bought it and the roof had five, seven, eight years attached. Now the roof start to go. Now you got to fix the roof. That's another four or $5,000. That's another year gone. Yeah. So now you lost two years when you could have sold the property in five and $4,800 times that by five. You would have made about $60,000, six, somewhere around there. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Well, not 60, somewhere around $40,000 right. for five years with zero money coming out of your pocket. And on your taxes, you would have done an awesome job. Another thing I teach people is creating your own property management company. Mm -hmm. I'm big on taxes and taxes is a form of cash flow. If you own investment properties, you should have a property management company that you subcontract the other property ma management company that you hired. They should be paying your, your property management company because now you're writing off all those expenses, right? And now you're paying yourself a salary. So now think about all the tax deductions with the property management company. Mm -hmm. You have a home office. You're writing 20% light, rent, or mortgage, gas, cell phone, internet, car expense if you use Everlance the app. You see what I mean? Yeah. So now that's why I don't keep it no more than five years. Got so you. it's all about the cash flow. Yeah, got you, got you. Man, I got I got, I got a couple questions, man. So um let's go. I like, let's I like go how, yeah I like how you broke that down um the five years. So is there so just to make sure um I understand correctly. So is your idea all right go in there if the major stuff has five plus years on it I'm gonna keep it for five cash out and move to the next one? Is that kind of your strategy? Yeah, well, here's the strategy. Great question. I'm glad you brought that up. The strategy is after five years, you will be a seasoned out-of-state investor in five years. Seasoned. So now here's the option which you can do. You're going to sell that property and say, you know what, depending on the market, I'm going to move up and get to me some multi-units now. Mm. Now you might want to say, I'm going to get that four unit because I want that for my children. 
or I want that for my grandkids, or I want to move my business depending on how you tailored your business. Like for example, mine is tailored to become a property management company to umbrella all of mine in the, in, at the interim, right? So now you might sell that and go, well, now I'm, I'm gonna buy that multi-unit and now we're gonna keep this for 10 years because we're gonna start managing it, which means you're gonna be the one placing the tenants. You're gonna be the one keeping the, that security deposits and doing all those extra things. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So now it depends on the growth. But other than that, if you don't wanna do that, then complete, completely do the same thing. Because in between that one property in five years, you should have purchased 10 more, easy. Yeah, You get what I mean? You should have more than that one. You should have so many by then that you're going, where do I take my company to the next stage? Where mine, for example, like I said, I'm just over the five-year mark. So my company now, I have people that, that were uh, students of mine. Now that they're very educated and well-known, now they're working for the company. Now they're doing acquisitions. Now they're partnering up with me. Now we're moving into the bigger units. Now we're getting ready to do these, these gigantic things. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it depends on where the growth are you gonna go from here to five years and projection is very important. Definitely, I love it, I love it, man. So um, you started with those three, those three homes that you got pretty quickly in uh, Indianapolis. How did, where did it go from there? You said, and this was uh, five years ago that you started out of state? Yeah, I started okay. at five and I can tell you all the states I'm in now. Yeah. I'm in Indianapolis, I'm in Milwaukee, I'm in Alabama and I'm in Georgia. And now I'm in contract in Cleveland and I'm in contract in Memphis. Man, you're just all over the map, huh? Yeah, I'm an out of state investor, not a one state <laughs> investor. That's what I tell people to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm an out of state investor where the market's hot, I'm going. You know what I mean? Cause I don't yeah. have to go. Like I've mentioned before, I've only seen two houses out of my max 24. Yeah. I've never seen them. It's about delegating duty. You know, I, I've, I've seen the ones in Georgia because I have family there. That's mm -hmm. the only reason. But the key is when you, you don't have to, getting past fear is with the inception of knowledge that you get. When you get the knowledge in you and you delegate duties, it's my inspector's duty mm -hmm. to know, to tell me about the property. It's my property manager's duty to tell me how the tenants are going. What do I need to go for? Anyone who's ever purchased a home, you walked in a home and you were excited, you're looking all around, but then what did you do? You hired an inspector to tell you what was wrong. Right. Because you wouldn't have known, so, you know? So now if it's not your personal primary residence, I don't need to be there because I don't need to go. Is this living room big enough for my furniture? Right. Is this backyard big enough? You know what I mean? Yeah. So the thing is being able to delegate. When you're putting yourself in a position to glow, grow as a conglomerate, you have to be able to put on these different hats. You know, your CEO hat, your management hat, like you got to be able to to uh, purposely say to yourself, I let go of these things and give it to this person and let go and give it to this one, let go to this one, because your vision is bigger than that one property that you're stuck on because you need to see it, that you're wondering so much about what's going on with it, that you're so caught up in uh, making sure it works, that it's stopping your growth. Right. I know people that are investors. Right. And they have properties driving distance mm -hmm. from New York to Baltimore. Yeah. And they will drive there. And then they would say things like, man, I just can't grow. I'm trying to figure out how to have my company grow, you know, 10 X and get it from two, three million, maybe to 10 or 20 million. And I'm like, you know why? Because you can't let go of the fear. Yeah. You can't delegate those duties. The time that you're driving back and forth from that highway, that's time you can be learning how to become a CEO. Like you cannot become a CEO if you're still trying to be the janitor. That's no way it's gonna happen. You know, and that's one thing for me I'm focused on and I would like to teach everyone that I work with as I ask them this key question. Are you a landlord or are you an investor? Because one is gonna stop the other from growing. So pick which one you wanna be and we can go from there. You know, and a lot of times people say, I wanna be an investor. I love it. I love it, man. Um, so you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're all over the map, all over the map, man. So <laughs> no, from, I know. From, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better. I'm gonna do better. No, you're good. You're good. You said you're, you're out of state investor, not a one state investor. You're good. You're good. So you're, you're all over the map, man. You got properties in a lot of different places. Um, I guess, could you walk us through like, you know, 
I guess, high level, like what you saw in the different cities, like I don't think we've had mm. um, anyone on the show invest in Milwaukee or Wisconsin at all for, for that matter. Um, so you said Wisconsin, I think Memphis, Georgia, um, you know, because obviously you saw something there. So, you know, love oh, to yes. see, like what it was that you saw in those markets um, that, that said, yes. you know what, this is where I'm going next. Cash flow, right? Mm-hmm. It's always, it's always uh, cash flow and conversation and, and knowing other investors. Yeah. When I wanted to hit Alabama, I was having conversations with other investors and the conversation went, I think Amazon's coming down here. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff we share with each other. I'm like, all right, bet. Birmingham, here we go. You know, I always wanted to be in, in, in Alabama a long time anyway. You know what I mean? So I said, all right, bet. Let me look. So then I start looking at some numbers, making some calls to some some uh, uh Real some uh, realtors talking to other investors who I might find on bigger pockets that's out there. And I go, yo, so what's the temperature like? What is, well, you know, it's going good here, this area, man. This is going good. I'm doing my numbers here and I'm getting this, I'm getting that. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Amazon might be moving down this way. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Over in, uh, there's another town over. And I said, bet, you know what? If worse come to worse, even if they don't come, my cash flow is going to be great. And I was invested in Georgia mm-hmm. and we, the way that rent and money making in real estate works is like the tsunami, right? Mm-hmm. It's like what happened in Brooklyn. Manhattan properties went up so high that the rent started to skyrocket. And when that happened, it caused this wave for the people who couldn't afford, what do they do? They just moved to the next town over. They went from Manhattan to right across the bridge in Brooklyn to Fort Greene, which was expensive. I mean, Brooklyn Heights, which is expensive. Then Fort Greene, and the people from Fort Greene had to go to Clinton, and the people who couldn't afford Clinton had to come to Bed-Stuy, and the people who couldn't afford Bed-Stuy would go to, you get what I'm saying, that yep. way. Yep. So being at Georgia, Atlanta, so many people moved to Atlanta. I said, guess what they're going to do? Rent's going to go up in Atlanta, and what's the next state over? Alabama. I like that. Alabama. I said, you know what? Let me buy in Alabama. So when I first bought in Alabama, rent was $500. I'm getting like $1,000 now. That's people from Georgia who were paying that kind of money going, man, Georgia's too expensive. So I'm getting easy $700 to $1,000 in Alabama now when I started wow. out at $500. You know why? Because those people who couldn't afford it no more, they, they either sold their house because the profits were so good. They bought a house for $30,000. And somebody said, I'm going to give you $200,000. For, you know, not 400, but I'm gonna give you 200, 300,000. They're like, we gonna sell and we gonna move to Alabama. Or now when they sold, where did their tenants go? Their tenants couldn't afford the rent. Alabama. So you have a lot of people who were um, disconnected or kicked out. Mm-hmm. And now they're in Alabama causing that rent to go up. I bought a property in Alabama real quick. Yeah. for <clears throat> It was a duplex for $80,000. Right. Another an, another wholesaler, which is another key thing as an investor, building a relationship with wholesalers. Mm-hmm. I do most of my deals with them. So I knew the property was 80 duplex. It would be worth it could be worth around 100, 120,000. Right. One okay. side was vacant and it had a hole and a roof on that side. So I said, I'm going to take this eighty thousand dollar property. One tenant was in there. Oh, excuse me. One tenant was in there paying seven hundred bucks. So that's OK. The seven hundred bucks still covers the mortgage. What I'm doing is fix this side. I'm going to fix this side over here, fix the roof. And once I fix that side, fix the roof, rented them both out. Both of them are renting now for 800. Wow. But once I did that, that property went up to $160,000. 160. You know why? Because everything started happening. The traffic started coming in. Amazon started coming in. Everybody wanted to be in Birmingham, downtown Birmingham. Now everything in Birmingham is going nuts. Wow. So that one property... That one I might keep more than five years. That one yeah. right there because of what's going on. Unless somebody knocks on my door and says, I give you $300,000. My thing is this. If you're able to cash out, your double your money. After you pay the mortgage off, double to triple your money, take it and go. Yeah. Like, like if, you know, let me give you an example. Like my property here was 400. And, you know, I'm going to be leaving here because I'm coming down to Georgia. Mm-hmm. I already bought my house two years ago. That's where I'm going to be setting up my, my property management company. And the reason why I'm buying so many properties in Alabama, Georgia, Memphis area, right, mm-hmm. to, for my future plans. 
Yeah. So now my friends and my people, my family ask me, "Were you going to sell? You're going to sell the brownstone?" I see. I'm gonna sell it. Like, Why are you gonna sell it? You, you know, you get six thousand dollars a month rent. I said, okay, I could take six thousand dollars a month rent, or I could take one point seven million dollars. Why? We you know how long it takes six thousand to get to one point seven. I'm cashing out. Yeah. Why would I want to keep that property for six thousand dollars a month? You know what I mean? But we tend, what we tend to do is get emotional, and don't want to let things go. When you have to say to yourself. Everything's a business. Every single thing has mathematics and business implications to it. You have to be able to release and let go of the emotional side of things because when you do that, you'll think more wisely and more beneficial for you and your family. Mm -hmm. There are people who will hold a family heirloom that their great grandmother gave them, a brooch or something that she paid $100 for. And this thing is worth thirty to $50,000. And they go, I'm not going to sell it because my great grandmother gave it to me. When your great grandmother probably saying, take that money and create generational wealth with it, buy a home, do something with it. Because you know what? If that that brooch or whatever falls into the wrong family member hand, they're going to sell it and do something dumb with the money. So my thing is, yeah, family heirlooms are fine, but there comes a certain point when it's, it's an object, when the money you can do something bigger with, Got and it. then you will make your great grandmother happy. Got it. I got a question about that. I got a question about that. So yeah. yeah, you see it, you know, on the internet and otherwise don't sell grandma's house. Um, so there, there seems to be two sides, right? One side is like hold forever, never sell. And the other is kind of in the vein of, of what you're saying, like hold for a period of time, sell and do something with the money. Um, and I feel like it's like a back and forth, right? It's a back and forth debate. Right. Um, which is interesting. Uh, so what do you say to those who say, I'm never selling, you know, like I, I know somebody out here in LA, um, they're, they have a house worth several million dollars that's been in their family for like, at least probably 40, 50 years. What do you say to that wow. person that's sitting on most likely a paid off property or with very yeah. little debt on it and very well could cash out several million dollars or in another market, several hundred thousand dollars. Um, right. What do you say to the person who's like, I don't know what to do with the money or I just don't want to sell. Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that was key. What you just said, they don't know what to do with the money. Cause mm -hmm. that my thing would be, what is your plan? Like mm -hmm. you're going to stay in this home. You know, they left you the house for 4 million, $5 million left it to you. It's paid off. It's worth $5 million. So what is your plan? Do you have kids? Are you going to leave it to your kids? What is the responsibility of your kids? Because we all say we have great kids until they become adults. <laughs> then we, we see the true characteristics of your children. You know what I mean? Yeah. So my thing is this. Even if you don't want to sell the house, prepare to do the right thing. And what I mean by that is I talk about a trust, right? If you're not going to sell your home, put your house in a trust, which is my breakout, the video that kind of made me popular. Take your house out of your name. Put your house in a trust. What I did was I created a video in a, and I showed people how the trust from 1934 of Rockefeller was able to pay 11 generations, right? This is what I did on my snow day. Like wow. I, I, I have the, the weirdest thing, right? So <laughs> I said, I created a video. It's on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. how, to how to take $500,000 and create generational wealth. What you can do with that house that's worth $4 million, you say, I don't want to sell it. I'm going to leave it to my children. What if you leave it to your children and they sell the $4 million and now they both blow the money? Now the whole concept is gone. So now you put that $4 million home in a trust. Mm -hmm. In a trust, your children are the beneficiaries. You say the house is worth $4 million. My children get $1 million of that. $1 million. The other $3 million stays in the trust and gets invested in the S&P 500 market for 18 years, right? And I'm going to tell you why. This is what this is what Rockefeller did. Yeah. So now when your children have children, which are going to be your grandkids, your grandkids don't get a piece of the trust till they turn 18. So now remember, you just put $3 million into a SP500 gaining 6% interest every year for the next 18 years, because that's when your grandkids get a piece of the trust. So now when they turn 18, they get 
Most likely now that three million is about six. So now they get 10%. So they all get 600,000 a piece, 600,000. Let's say you have four, 600,000, four, that's 2.4 million. You have 6 million in there. So now you have 2.6 million, no, 3.6 million dollars left over. That's gonna stay invested in the SP 500 until your grandkids have your great grandchildren. And when your great grandchildren are born, they don't get their money until what age? Come on, say it with me. 18. 18. Now that money just got invested again for 18 more years, more likely 20 some odd years, right? So now they get 10%. Every grandkids get 10%. So now that might be a, a larger amount, but still that money again goes down. This is what Rockefeller did for really? 11 generations. Wow. Yes. I didn't know that. 1934. Yes. This is how my life is, man. I, wow. I try to pull out the things for us to become successful. And we heard so many people talk about generational wealth. And this is what sparked me. Mm -hmm. Because we always say, buy a home, buy a home, buy a home, buy a home. But you don't tell nobody how to buy a home. But now we got people telling people how to buy a home. Mm -hmm. Create generational wealth, create generational wealth. But you don't tell people how to do it. And I said, okay, I'm going to find out how to do it. How? Find somebody who successfully did it. Who? Rockefeller. Boom. Here goes trust. Let me spend a snowy day in New York. And I looked through the whole thing, figured out how they named the unnamed children, how he dictated how it should go. And it's a fascinating thing when you get time. Check my timeline or my YouTube. You'll I'm looking see at that tonight, man. <laughs> I took a marker and a board and drew it out. And everybody was fascinated. And literally, I said, there's no excuse now. Yeah. I showed you how to do it with a $500,000 life insurance policy that costs $150 a month. Man. So that's what I would tell that person. Yeah. The, 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 the short answer, do something where no one can ruin the wealth of that family in that home and yeah. can spend it all by putting it in a trust. We should never use a will no more. When you hear the word trust, you always think about wealthy families. When you hear the word will, you just think somebody died and left somebody something. Yeah. Man, we should I, start using trust. Wow. I'm like blown away, man, because I think for us, for, for the black community, I think that's the next level. Get into a trust. Like I, I, this is the first that I'm hearing about a trust in this, I guess, in such detail, which clearly shows that there's an issue here, right? It's something that we should all be yes. well aware of. We talk about generational wealth, but the, the missing piece, I feel like, is the instructions. Like what happens after I'm gone? What if, you know, you just give an op you, you just gave an option, right? So if something is sold, there could be specific instructions. If it's, so, you know, and that, that way, 1934, that's almost 1934. 100, that's, that's, that's not too far from 100 years <laughs> that that money is just yep. literally, and I'm pretty sure unless they tricked all the money off, every one of those generations, they're doing okay. <laughs> I, I would assume, yes. <laughs> you know, um, Man, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. I got. I'm checking that video. I'm yes. gonna get off today. <laughs> Definitely, man. A trust is so important. I tell you, that's one of my biggest things. Where once, like I said, I did that video. That was where people were started calling me to do interviews and, and and grams and live. Like, dude, I saw this video. I was looking up trust, and you came up. Tell us about it. And then my trust conversation, which for me it was a setup. Because I literally wanted to use the introductory of the trust and put in your house as an investor in a trust or a homeowner in a trust so I can now teach you the value of the trust. And then I could turn around and go, oh, now you know you can put your life insurance in a trust. Oh, you can put your 401k in a trust. By the way, you should only put everything you have in a trust. That's how it's done. You don't just leave it to individuals if you're planning to grow that wealth. You know what I mean? Yeah. James Brown will was held up in probate court for 14 years because his ex-wife came forward and said, we are still married. And the courts continuously charged a fee for 14 years until they could prove that they were no longer married. But if he would have had a trust, nothing stops the execution of a trust. Whatever it says is law. She would have just been in the cold. A will, any member or anybody could come out the woodworks and stop your will from being executed. Yeah, man, that might be one of the biggest gems of this of the, this conversation right here, man. <laughs> Seriously, because think about it. We all talk about a will. Uh, we all know, you know, the life insurance issue. Um, but the will, the trust, like I feel like 
people will get a lot of clarity from that. Um, I'm telling you, I feel like that's like the missing piece right there. Um, yes, really yes. Yes, you feel, you feel me. You feel I feel like, it, man, I feel it. And, and, and the sad part about it is that I can tell you and I can teach you how to become an out-of-state investor. I've taught many people yeah. to buy properties. I've taught people how to do business lines of credits, how to get the loans, how to do hard money, how to get pre-approvals. Like I have one gentleman I work with, he just got pre-approved for 1.1 million sitting on the side waiting for, like I can teach you all of that, but I can't teach you how to uh, create a trust or how to open up a trust or how to think about your wealth for your family later. Like I can't teach you that. That says something that has to be in you to value that, that thing to go, you know what, I'm doing well and my kids are gonna do well, but you know what, let me create that thing to help my, help mom, what I'm doing not to be done in vain and continuously get handed down. And let me take the time and create a trust. I can't teach you that. That's something that has to be in here already. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Love that, man. But I, but I gave you the tools and now there's no excuse. Yeah, so now, I, got it now. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I know I got my accountability now, uh, but everybody listening, make sure you get a trust for everything, um, you know, you have, or make sure you at least do heavy research and look into it if you haven't already. Um, you know, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know. Um, and it's something I think about too. Like I'm pretty young. I'll be 30 this year, but you know, there's more I need to do in that regard, you know, just to make sure my stuff is set up because tomorrow's not promised, you know, so you don't want there to be a bloodbath and a fight after you, after you, uh, pass, That's what you, will know, happen. you want everything to be set yeah. up. It, it just happens. Like it happens too much in our community, man. Like someone, someone is gone, you know, people trying to raise money. People don't know where anybody's stuff is at. There's no instructions left. And I, you know, I think no one wants to talk about death. That's just the fact of the matter. That's a natural human thing. But when you look around, those who don't have life insurance or don't have stuff set up, those who, it, it looks like us. We've all experienced it. Every it, single it one of us. So us. Yeah. yeah so I'm not mean, talking about, not wanting to talk about death is like not for me. Mm -hmm. It's like not wanting to talk about money because when you talk about death, you're talking about money. Do you have it? Who's going to have to raise it? Where it's at? Where it's going to go? Like literally the conversation of death is about money. And when you realize that the two go hand in hand and you realize I have to do better because it's like, like you said, when you pass away, people are going to go, who's he leaving the houses to? Who's, where's his life insurance policy? Did he have life insurance? Who's going to be the executor of this? Who now wants probate gets their hand on the will, probate, probate goes, okay, who's going to be the one to carry out this, whatever. And then let's say you left two of your children more than the, than the other one. The other one goes, I want to contest the will. Probate court holds everything up. Nobody gets anything. Now let's say your money in your bank accounts needed to bury you. That money can't be dispersed to bury you because it's being held up in probate. Imagine you having a spouse, one of your kids from your other marriage or relationship, or even your kids in that marriage go, no, I'm contesting my dad will, but your wife needs that money in one of your bank accounts to bury. She can't get the money. So you just sitting there waiting until this is over to be buried so they can free up the money. You have to prepare and do something the right way. So talking about death literally is talking about money. Yeah, it really is. Definitely, man. Definitely. Uh, so what is, uh, what does the future look like for you? You mentioned that, um, you want to come, you, you, you transition down to door Georgia. Eventually you'll sell the property in, in bed um, and kind of start your, your, I guess, spread your wings, if you will, but yeah, yeah. Break, it, break it down to us. And also, um, okay. how many, how many units are you up to now out of state? Well, right now I was at 24 uh -huh. and I went down to 18 and right mm -hmm. before Right before COVID hit, I sold uh, three. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of my air pieces went dead. I sold three in Milwaukee and went down to 15 because I was going to buy a bigger unit. Mm -hmm. But once COVID hit, then I said, you know what? I'm going to stick to my plan and I'm doing stick to my section eight singles and doubles. You know, the most I do is a quad. I have one quad, mm -hmm. right? And the reason why I don't like to, and I'm going to go definitely to where my future is going, but I want to try yeah. to enlighten people on the, the thing about 
should I do multi or should I do singles? You know, that's been a thing. I tell people, you can do singles all day and knock them out the box. You can do doubles all day and knock them out the box. Now, if you're going to do a, a fourplex or greater, consider the bills that come with it. With singles, doubles, and even fourplexes, I only pay insurance and taxes, my mortgage. I don't pay water and I don't pay electric. Um, I had a, a, a terrible situation in some of my two, two of my Milwaukee's where I was paying water. That's a nightmare. Wow. That water kills your cash flow because all you need is one tenant with a bad toilet flap for three months because your property manager don't live there. I seen a water bill for $3,000. Are you serious? What? $3,000. I'm like, what the heck? It was two tenants, toilets. Boop, 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 boop. And now, what you gonna do? You can't argue that you gotta pay that. So now your cash flow is dead for the year or either six months, or eight months. So for me, I only like dealing with things that are mortgage, taxes, and insurance. You can get the bigger units, but now weigh the odds. That's why when you buy a bigger units, you always say, let me see the, the utility bills. Let me see the water bill. Let me see the 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 garbage bill. Let me see with the electric if you pay a hallway and basement. Because yeah. you got to minus that from your cash flow. People yeah. can say, oh, there's cash flow in five thousand dollars. But yeah, but the water bill may be five hundred dollars a month. Then the sanitation bill may be two fifty. Then you get what I'm saying? All yeah. those little things make a difference. Where if you just had a duplex, you might be cashing more. Yeah. So excuse me. So for me, uh I'm staying in my zone up. I have 15 now. And the goal, like I said, I'm in contract with seven more properties now because I'm going back at getting my section eights, getting my single units, yeah. building my portfolio up. And for the, what the future looks like for me is I'm going to be going down to Georgia and I'm going to start my own property management company because now I'm paying property management companies, which is great. And I tell people when you buy properties, you have property management companies, 10% or 8%. If you rent is 800, they're getting 10%, that's $80. Why are you worrying about $80 if you're making the 720? You never, when you see people to go rob a bank, they go in there and take the bundles of money on the shelf. They don't take the dollars falling on the floor. That 720 is the bundle. You don't worry about that $80 falling on the floor. All right. We came here for the bundles. So you, um, now that I'm paying, you know, all these property management uh, fees, which is fine for me, you know, it could equate to five, $7,000. But now the tax implications that they get, they're making great money. Yeah. But if I start my own, the money that I'm paying them when a property becomes vacant, I pay for the placement of the new tenant. I pay for the lease. All that is fine. I'm definitely not complaining. But now if I think about that with 20 units, 30 doors, yeah, like that number goes, wow, I made $170,000, but also made them $20,000, you yeah. know, I, that 20,000 could be mine. And that's not including the tax write-off. So that's what my goal is to start a property management company, manage all my properties. Then I want to get a 20 or 50 unit building, have that under my umbrella. But then the ultimate, ultimate goal, and this is for my mentor, you know, my mentor is a genius. You know, he, this is what made me start my courses. Yeah. What he did was started a course. And from him teaching people who wanted to learn, he was able to handpick the ones that had special skills to work for him. So he got paid for hiring people. And that's what I did. People wanted to learn. I seen special talents in them. And I said, look, you, you want to come work with the company? Sure, bet. I can use you. So now I have pick them. And now they're helping my company grow. Yeah. Right. So now here's the ultimate. What my um, other investors and my mentor is telling me that the ultimate hustle is maintenance fee. Maintenance fee. Maintenance fee is a fancy word for rent. So think about this. So what I want to do is get my land build 20, 30 condos, sell off the condos and still get rent. But what we call it, maintenance fee. So if I have 20 people giving me $400, that's $8,000 a month wow. I'm making. $8,000 a month I'm getting every, excuse me, eight, yeah, $8,000 a month I'm getting for all of those 20 units that they bought from me. And now when they sell them, the next person coming in, they got to come see me again. Wow. That's like $96,000 a year. And when you think about what it takes to manage and maintenance, 
it's not that much work. It's not that expensive. It's really not. Major catastrophes only happen if you don't take care of the things before they break down. And remember, yeah. I'm talking about building 20 condos, yes. new piping, new roofs, new this. So that's the ultimate goal. 20, 30, 40 condos, charge maintenance fees. Family lives off of that money forever. The name lives on because I want to have my family name on it. On the gates you drive through, my great grandkids could go, this is what uh, my great granddad did. Man, I love that. I love that. Um, man, this has been such an inspirational interview, man. I'm just thinking like, you know, I'm biased, obviously, because I'm from Brooklyn. But it's like, <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to see somebody, man, who, you know, grew up, grew up in Brooklyn, understands how it is, and just where, where you're at now, you know, I think it's very inspirational, man. Um, just thinking about the, the backstory, you know, it started uh -huh. when you were a kid, helping your dad take his boots off. He planned a seed in you at that time. He said, I'm doing this so you don't have to go through what I go through. Fast forward, Powerful. you're an adult. You see opportunity. You don't quite know what could be, but you're like, you know what? You know, it's in bed style. It's by the train. It's a big house. It's going to be my own thing. There was something. You had, a, you had, a, you had an inkling. And so you use, use a construction loan, fix up that property, use part of that money to buy another property, and then... <laughs> The rest was history. Learned about out of state, built that portfolio, um, and here you are now. And this is it's still only the beginning. You know, you have a, a long way of going, a lot more to accomplish, man. But yeah, this I'm I'm inspired. You know, I can't wait to put this out. I know the people will get a whole lot from it, man. So I, I really appreciate you coming on, brother. Thank you, thank you, man. Like, listen, my goal is to teach people about the out of state market, like yourself. And I want people who live in these big markets to not feel like they're um, they're boxed out, you know, because mm -hmm. everything is so expensive. You know, my mission is to make sure I let them know you can get you a sixty thousand dollar property because that's only twelve thousand dollars down. You can partner with somebody and go six and six, and you guys could get started. In my whole course that I have, and I'm gonna give guys a great discount for tuning in if they want to get the course definitely you know how we got to do it oh, yeah. but um i want people to definitely i teach you step by step mental i, I unlearn my first lesson is unlearn to relearn so i need to adjust your thinking on the fear of the property being out there i need to teach you how to do your numbers i need to teach you how to use a rental company i need to teach you there are things that i went through like bestplaces.net that was one of the places that i went to learn how to find out demographics of a neighborhood how much money comes in the state, how much jobs came in, how many jobs left, how much money is allocated per student, how many students in a classroom, what is the crime rate, what is considered um, a, high, a high level crime. Because the trick with buying out of state also, people can see a high crime area and go, I'm not buying it, but the high crime is car break-ins. You see what I mean? You're fooled because yeah. you see the high crime. You have to be able to analyze and go, oh, both of these are high crime. One has high crime car break-ins. The other one has a lower crime rate, but those crimes are murders, Yeah, stick-ups. You would rather take the high crime that are car break-ins and pickpockets. You know, so all of this stuff I learned and, and, and maneuvered through, and I've, here's another strategy for me. I've learned how to find deals. I don't know if you want me to go into all this good stuff. <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get into that in the, in the community, man. We'll get into all that right. in the community. They, 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 yeah, they need this. Because I was going to yeah. tell you how you... How We're you gonna do it. Do everything. We're gonna How do, you do it. everything. Yeah, if y'all want the problem. if y'all want the game, man, join the Black Real Estate Dialogue Real Estate Investing Community. We're gonna have Storm. He's gonna dive into a whole lot more detail. Um, but man, that's that's great. So where can people find you? Where can people buy your course? Oh. Um, access all your information, and you know if there's anything else you offer, coaching and such, definitely let it let us know, and we'll make sure that's in the show notes when this episode comes out. Definitely, definitely, they could find me on Instagram at Storm underscore management, underscore investment. Um, my course, you can go to my hub. My hub is askthemovement.com, which I need to really explain real quick. Once I got into wanting to teach people, I created a movement called ASK, A-S-K, always seek knowledge. So ask the movement was designed for people to feel comfortable with asking questions because it's so crucial to be able to ask someone a question and not be fearful of getting a response back or getting denied or sending that message to that individual and they're just, no one's responding. 
because that's what you hear. Uh, a lot of people who send me messages and question, they go, man, I can't believe you answered. I can't believe you called me. I can't believe you gave <laughs> me the number to call you. And I said, because I'm on a mission to make sure that you're able to take that one moment of feeling the right way to do something. And I don't crush it by not answering, yeah. you know, cause there's those moments that are pivotal times in people's life. And um, you really can help them cross the threshold to going, I'm doing it because I spoke to him and I've impacted people with just from little messages and things like that. So ask the movement is a real something that's really near and dear to me. This is one of my shirts and I have hats and hoodies yeah. and all kinds of stuff. So you would go to askthemovement.com. You go, you will see a course, click on the course. You'll see it gives you the breakdown. I have over 50 something lessons. You must hand in homework. I'm attached to the course where when you sign up, I see it. I, I watch you um, as you work, you submit the homework. I check the homework. You can't get to the next level until you finish because I need you to know your numbers. If you don't know your numbers and you're just passing through, then it's like just pushing you through school. You're gonna get out there and fail in the real world. So um, be ready for that, all my assignments. Um, and the key thing, I'm holding hands with you through the process. And I tell everyone, don't ask me to be your mentor. It's, it's gonna cost you for me to mentor you. But if you buy the course, I automatically become your mentor. And the course is cheaper than me mentoring you. So just take the course and then automatically, I'm your mentor for life because I want to see you succeed. So it's my Instagram I gave you, my hub is Ask the Movement and um, uh, my YouTube where I have a lot of videos and I'm starting to transport a lot of bigger spouse there is Storm Management Investment also at YouTube. So where you guys feel free to send me a message, any thoughts, any questions, trust me. Oh, and also take your house out of your name for, your, for you guys who own your own homes. Uh, I have, I wrote two eBooks and I have those literally on sale up there for like $12 for both. Get the eBooks, learn about a trust, learn about taking your home out of your name for the benefits of asset protection, the benefits of becoming a property management and collecting taxes, um, and the benefits of being able to do bigger write-offs. For example, if you were doing renovations and things of that nature, that thing is a masterpiece on how to do FHAs and everything with a trust definitely we will have all of that in the show notes all of that in the show notes uh awesome well thank you all so much for listening to another episode of the black real estate dialogue podcast if you'd like to support us as an official patron go to patreon.com slash black real estate dialogue if you'd like to stay up to date on what we have going on text bred to twenty one thousand. and lastly if you'd like to join the bread real estate investing community go to black all the information will be there Hope to hear from you all soon.